morning and uh, welcome back to another lesson on on the history of English literature. In the last lesson, we saw Old English or uh, Anglo-Saxon period in the history of English literature. We became familiar with a few important works and a few writings. Whatever I gave are very, very important from the examination point of view, not only for the entrance examinations, but also for your net year. Keep that in your mind. Okay, today I will be discussing a few uh, in my first lesson about Middle English period. As you can see, uh, on the screen in front of you, this period extends uh, between 1066 CE and uh, 1558, uh, the year when Queen Elizabeth I ascended to the throne of England. Now, there will be or to five lessons covering Middle English period. Okay, let's begin then. One of the major writings of Middle English period was Geoffrey Chaucer, who lived between 1443 and uh, and uh, 1500. Okay, now. Let's, I have divided this period into smaller, smaller sections for you to understand better. So, before we come to Chaucer, we just look at the pre Chaucerian period and some works in that period. Okay. First, the historical background. That would be the, the pattern that I will be discussing. I just give you the main points, the main events and if you are intrigued, if you become uh, curious, you can do your own readings. Establishment of Norman dynasty, that happened. In fact, Middle English period begins with the establishment of Norman uh, dynasty. I'll talk about it a little later. Internal struggles between king, nobles, and the clergy and the people, a lot of internal problems, conflicts within the English society of that period. Numerous wars, both at home and abroad, at home, civil wars, abroad with other kingdoms or countries. Rise of the religious orders, a lot of, uh, sorry, a lot of, a lot of. Religious congregations, especially Christian congregations, uh, bloomed in that period. Then the blossoming of chivalry and the spirit of romance. Chivalry uh, uh, means, you know, the polite, uh, honorable behavior uh, of, of uh, the knights, the heroes, and also uh, bravery and courage shown on, on the battlefield. All these things uh, together we, we label as chivalry or a person who possesses these characteristics uh, is often known as chivalry. Okay, romance. Again, okay. romance here doesn't actually mean the love relationship between, between uh, two members of the opposite sex. No, okay. romance means adventures, heroic deeds. That's what romance uh, points to. When we talk about it in literature, okay, then crusades, you know, these these crusades were uh, carried out by the Christian uh, soldiers, uh, spreading about you know uh, between 1096 to uh, 1271 CE. Around five crusades uh, uh, were carried uh, out, and uh, these crusades were carried out at the behest of at the command of the Pope to recapture uh, Jerusalem, okay? Now, 
Another important event, a very important one, Oxford uh, University was established in 1096 and Cambridge in 1209 CE. Okay. This is very important uh, from the examination point of view. That is, standard English use was East Midland dialect. East Midland dialect. In Old English, it was uh, West Saxon dialect. Okay. Old English period used West Saxon dialect. These two are very important for, for your examinations, for the entrance as well as for your left there. Now, this is also important. Modern English evolved or developed from East Midland dialect. Not even. Rates. Okay. Now let's have a, a, a bird's eye view of those historical events that happened, uh, you know, uh, from 1066 at the Battle of Hastings, October 14, 1066 CE. Carol, the last Anglo-Saxon. King was defeated by William the Conqueror or the Duke of Normandy. Normandy you know, was, was a region in modern France and William was, was the, the prince or the regent in that region and he, he led a huge army against uh, the Anglo-Saxon king uh, her and he was defeated and from that day the Norman dynasty was established in England. So began the Norman rule. Okay. That's the history. So William the Conqueror is there, he is the king. Now a lot of things will happen and as you move Ahead, we will see, but I would not be focusing on the historical events. Uh, I mean, in depth, wherever it is necessary, I'll make allusions. Otherwise, our major concern is literature produced in this period. Okay, now in Old English period, you know, poetry, uh, the words used, one of the features or the main predominant feature of words or poetry was alliteration and in Middle English period this was replaced by rhyme. Now you know what alliteration is, what rhyme is, okay. Major writers and works of the period. Number one right now, Lyamon or Lagamon. You may not even have heard about and I am sure very few students of the literature are familiar uh, with his name. He lived and wrote okay, in the 12th century. That's what we know about his, his, his uh, biography. Okay. He is the author of the words chronicle, the brood. Brood means not animal. Okay. He, not, uh, uh, he is not animal there. The brood, one of the most notable English poems of the 12th century Middle English period. Okay. Now, it is the first work, that's very important, in English to treat of the matter of Britain. I will talk about it a little later in this lesson. To treat of the matter of Britain. We have macro Britain, macro France, macro Rome. I'll talk about it a little later. Now, what is this? In this, in this group, the legends surrounding Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table for the first time discussed in this poem, The Brood. Now, you know who was Arthur? According to medieval history, okay? King Arthur led a, a very huge force against 
the Anglo-Saxon invasions of England when the Romans left England in 410 CE. You remember all those, okay? Now, many historians would tell you that uh, Arthur, in fact, was a kind of, uh, of a figment of imagination created by the, the imagination of some writers. Nobody is sure, no scholars are very certain about his, his actual uh, existence, whether he was a real a king or he was simply created by some, some, some uh, writers with very fertile uh, imagination. We don't know. But as recorded, this is a story. He, he defended uh, England or his kingdom, his region in England against the Anglo-Saxon Saxon, uh, invaders from, from Germany. Okay. This poem, The Brood, is around 16, 16,000 long, okay, 16,000 lines or something. And it is written in alliterative lines, okay. This is, this poem deals with the history of Britain. How many of you know of the, the, the founder of England, Great Britain? Okay. If you don't know, now I will tell you in few words. It tells the history of Britain from the time of Brutus of Troy landing in modern England. Okay, now let me let me tell you the story. You know the Trojan War. We saw about the Trojan War. After the Trojan War, one guy, I think you can remember, Aeneas. About whom Virgil wrote a poem, Aeneas, or Aeneas, remember? Okay. Aeneas, who was a cousin of Paris, the son of Priam, king of Troy. Aeneas survived the Trojan War, as I have already told you. And with a few other survivors, he Set on a long voyage and after a lot of uh, adventures and obstacles and, and uh, sufferings, he reached modern Italy. And it is said uh, he founded Rome. Who? Aeneas. Now, who was Aeneas? Perhaps I didn't tell you, but I'm telling you now. Aeneas was the son of. Goddess Aphrodite and another another mortal and his uh, his name is Angesis. Okay, Angesis. A N C H I S E S. So Aeneas was the daughter, sorry, son. <laughs> Aeneas was the son of Aphrodite and Angesis, who was the brother of Priam, the king of Troy. You see the connection now? Aphrodite and Angesis, a mortal man, but from the royal family, had an affair. And out of that affair was born Aeneas. And Aeneas was on the side of, or he was fighting on the side of the Trojans. He survived. He and some of the survivors came to Italy and founded modern Italy. Okay. Then his descendants lived in Rome. His son, then grandson, and then great grandson, great great grandson, great 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 great, great grandson. Okay, now we come to the great 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 grandson that is Brutus. Not the Brutus. That you find in Shakespeare's play Julius Caesar. No. When Brutus was 15 years old, he, along with his father, went uh, on a hunting expedition and by mistake, accidentally, he shot an arrow and it struck his father and he died. Oh, one and one As a punishment, he was inside. Where? Into Greece. When he reached there, he found a lot of 
Trojans enslaved by a Greek king. So he fought against him and got his, no, his, his compatriots uh, freed. And Brutus, along with his, his, his compatriots, the freed Trojans, set out on a voyage. And then they came to an island after a long journey. And there was a dilapidated, abandoned, desert um, uh, temple, you know, devoted to uh, goddess Diana. And he prayed there. When he slept, during his sleep, he saw a dream. He had a dream. Diana appeared before him and told him that he will continue to travel. He will continue to, to travel. Uh, I am just going there. It's a whole day. Uh, here. He will continue to travel and will come upon an island known as Albion. What is that? Albion Island. And that would be his permanent home. He woke up from his dream, started his journey, keeping in mind Diana's knowledge, and he finally, he and his followers reached this island. Those days known as Albion, which was inhabited by some giants, a very few, and uh, Brutus and his followers fought against them, defeated them, gradually overpowered them, and established what is known as Great Britain, named after his name, Brutus. This is the mythological story of the of the foundation of Great Britain. Okay, now. All these events find place in this long poem written by Alaya Mama and named The Brood. Okay. Uh, you must, uh, I think uh, I have, uh, uh, what I have said is already recorded, is all written there. You can take out the notes. Here you find one name. Uh, this poem uh, traces the story of Brutus landing, Brutus of Troy. Why he gets named Troy? Because he is a descendant of that particular uh, race, okay, the Trojans. Now, till the death of Cadwalader, he was the last of the, of the uh, chain of Brutus, okay. After Brutus, many, 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 many were there, even Arthur. King Arthur is considered a descendant from, from Brutus, Brutus from Anus, you see. So, Cat Gualiter was the last of that team of kings and uh, he ruled uh, a place known as, uh, I think the name of his kingdom was Twinet, uh, Twinet, a small county of okay, in, in modern ways, that's it. So this poem traces uh, the story of Brutus, the descendant from uh, Aeneas, then uh, Arthur, Arthur, Arthur is also mentioned there, and, uh, and then Caed uh, Valider, the last of, of this chain of kings. This is the subject matter or, or the theme of the poem, the Brood. Have you got it now? Now, already I have narrated the story. The next anonymous, anonymous book, the next anonymous book, very important one, is Sir Gawain. Some pronounce Gawain, see? Uh, some pro uh, some uh, pronounce it Gavin. Others pronounce it uh, Gawain. Gavin or Gawain. Whatever you find it suitable, you can adopt. Sir, Gawain and the Green Knight. This is an alliterative poem in West Midland dialect. The, you may ask, sir, you said uh, alliteration was replaced by, by rhyme. I said predominantly. Some of them still follow uh, alliteration. And we don't know who wrote this poem, but this is a very famous one. Okay. Uh, sir, Gawain and the Green Knight. It is written in West Midland dialect. Very important from the examination point of view. Please note down. Okay. Other remarkable points of this period. Sometimes questions are asked. 
no matter whether asked for entrance examinations or, or for net zero. Have an idea of all of these points. Number one, pearl, two, purity, three, patience, and the owl and the nightingale. That's an interesting point. Pearl, very quickly, what is it? It is, it is, it is part energy for dream vision. What is dream vision? Dream vision uh, genre is very important. The poet or the narrator uh, falls asleep and uh, has a uh, dream, and in that dream, certain stories are. Uh, revealed or, or uh, narrated. So, this is known as dream vision uh, genre. Remember this. And uh, it's a, a part Christian allegory. Which one? Pearl. Okay. It is an allegory written on the occasion of, of the death of a, of a very uh, young girl. And the parent is grieving over her death. Okay. See? She died at the age of two. Pearl. She was like twelve. Okay. She is the pearl of the poet's life. This young girl, two year, two year old girl, who died, and the parent was so sad. Next one, purity. It talks about the virtues of cleanliness of body. Yeah, you must keep your body always clean, especially during this time when Corona uh, virus is uh, after us. Okay. And the delights of married love. Yeah. Married love is the most delightful. The poet argues. Okay. It takes the subject from where? From the Bible. You know the flood? The, the Noah's flood. Then the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah because of the sins committed by the people of that, that race, that religion, and the fall of of uh, uh, a king named named Balthasar or Belshazzar, the fall of the king Balthasar. So these incidents are taken from uh, from the Bible, from the Old Testament, and used in the poem purity. Each of these is described powerfully, and this poem is among the finest, among the finest in modern English. Which one? Purity. Remember that. Next one, patience. You know what it means. It is a poem that praises the virtue of patience. Yeah. All good things come to people who wait patiently. And good things will come to you very soon. No doubt about that. Okay. One should accept the will of God patiently. When many things happen, you must accept uh, uh, God's wish, God's will. Okay, surrender yourself to the will of God. That is the theme of the poem, patience. The owl and the nightingale is an interesting poem. Please, you must uh, go to Google and, and read the summary at least. You know, you know, the owl, the bird of the night, and the nightingale, the, the melodious song. You know, oh, the nightingale by John Keats, you know. Now, both of these birds are arguing about their their contributions, their contributions made to man life. How useful they are. Each one comes up with, with its, uh, its, its uh, uh, contributions to, to people around. And there is a very aggressive, a fierce argument or debate between the owl and the nightingale. They come up with their own arguments to, to show uh, their significance or their importance in this world and their, their relevance or their usefulness to, to the people around them. Read this poem, please. The romances means those heroic stories about great heroes and their exploits, their adventures, their wars and battles, won or lost. These are romances. Okay, now the group of romances dealing with the English history and its heroes is known as the matter of England. The matter of England. So this group of stories dealing with the British heroes, known as the matter of England. Then the group dealing with 
the, the exploits, advantages of King Arthur is known as the Matter of Britain. In particular, the Matter of Britain has a lot of romantic stories related to King Arthur. Now, if you want to know more about King Arthur, I wish I could tell you, but we don't have enough time for that. You can just go to Google and ask. Google, please tell me about King Arthur. Google will tell you or give you enough information. Okay? The group of romance is dealing with Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, remember? Mm -hmm. He died in 323 BCE. From there started what? Hellenistic. Hellenistic civilization. Okay. Now, about Alexander the Great. And also, and the siege of Troy is known as the matter of the great. The matter of Rome the great. This collection has uh, stories about Alexander and also the siege of Troy, the Trojan Wars. Then, the group dealing with Charlemagne. Charlemagne is known as the matter of France. Now, who was Charlemagne? Okay. Charlemagne lived between 748 and 814. He was known as Charles the Great or Charles the First. He was the king of the Franks, a Germanic tribe, France, who migrated little down in modern France. So the Franks were the predecessors of, of the French, the French people, the modern French. Okay. Then he was the king of the Lombards. Again, another, another uh, Germanic tribe uh, who formed the German kingdom somewhere in, in Italy. Okay. Then he was the, the emperor of the Romans from 800 to 814. The then Pope Leo III crowned him as the emperor of the Romans. And you know, uh, he belonged to a dynasty uh, known as Carolingian. Carolingian. The name is Carolingian dynasty. Carolingian dynasty. A Frankish, a Germanic, right? Uh, and it was a noble family. And this dynasty was founded by this noble man. Named Charles Martin. These are not important for your examination. But then I just tell you. Now, what's important is Charlemagne. He was a great king, and uh, during his reign, I think uh, he united uh, much of Europe. Maybe seventy to eighty percent of of Europe was united under his kingship. And he was a Christian emperor. That's why the Pope crowned him. Okay. In his role as emperor of the Romans, that was from 800 to 814, he encouraged what is known as Carolingian Renaissance. Oh, not yeah, Renaissance. What is Carolingian Renaissance? Rebirth of of learning. That's what is meant by uh, Renaissance. But here it was a kind of cultural, intellectual revival in Europe. So he encouraged intellectual life, he encouraged scholars and also cultural growth. All those things were uh, uh, encouraged by Charlemagne. So if it was to count who, uh, what is or what was uh, known as now, Carolingian Renaissance, then you must be able to answer this question uh, without much problems. And it happened during the reign of Charlemagne. That's what you must remember. Okay, uh, Carolingian uh, uh, Renaissance and Charlemagne. They are related to each other. Okay. And again, uh, this is what I have already told you. Can make down these notes if you want, and I am just uh, telling you things which are from the examination point of view very important, and the rest are there for you to take down. Okay, 
The next one, that's a very important uh, uh, work. This work is known as Angrene Rivale. The Angrene Rivale. In English, road for angresses. Now, who were these angresses? Some religious nuns. Okay? Who led very solitary life, not even talking to other people, always uh, living in enclosed uh, rooms without uh, talking to anyone, always in meditation and prayer. And this book, we don't know who wrote, uh, uh, was a book of advice, admonition, or guidelines given to those uh, religious nuns who want to stay in solitude and always in, in prayer and meditation. Okay, this is considered uh, uh, very important of the early prose text of the Middle English period. Okay. The Catherine Group, another, another uh, collection of books, known as the Catherine Group. Why it is known as the Catherine Group, you will not know. It is a collection of devotional works dating from 1182 to 10. Now, it consists of the lives of Saint Catherine, Saint Margaret, Saint Julia. Now we saw already. Then Holy Maidenhood. Why is Maidenhood? Okay. And a sermon. Uh, and a sermon on the soul. One is missing there, please add. Just type it to say. And a sermon on the soul called the guardianship of the soul. Now, why it gets Catherine group? It is collectively known as the Catherine group because the first book appearing is named as, uh, as Catherine. Okay, that's why it is Catherine group. It's not very important, but just remember, in case, in case the question comes, you know what the Catherine group is, okay? The next one, again, uh, uh, an anonymous work, The Vision of Tantale. Now, what is this? Uh, it is uh, uh, a work that reports the otherworldly vision. Now, some people have sometimes some vision of heaven, hell, purgatory, etc. So this relates the vision, the otherworldly vision of, of an Irish knight, an Irish uh, soldier of great courage and bravery, named uh, uh, Duke Dallas. Duke Dallas, uh, your enemy is Duke, Duke Dallas. He was, a, he was an Irish knight. And he had a vision of, of heaven, heaven, etc. The infernal vision. So this poem is about this. The vision of uh, today. It was the most popular and elaborate text in the medieval period. And belonging to the genre of visionary infernal literature. Infernal means about hell. So keep that in mind. The vision of Tandale belongs to the genre of visionary infernal literature. That's why we have to remember. The next one, yeah, that's a very important one. Chanson de Jest. Chanson de Jest. Don't worry, it is nothing. It's very simple. What is this? Song of Thieves. This consists of a lot of poems. Uh, celebrating the heroic deeds of, of uh, great heroes. Now, it is any of the old French epic poems about the King Arthur and Charlemagne. That's all. So, Chanson de Jeste. This is a collection okay, of poems. And, uh, and in this collection, any poem that deals with the, the exploits of either Arthur, King Arthur, or Charlemagne is generally known as 